This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Chapter 8 In the Moss Commune The Commissar of our Osobniak, having to lay in provisions, invited me to accompany him to the Moss Commune. It is the great food supply center, a tremendous organization that feeds Moscow and its environs. Its trains have the right of way on all lines and carry food from parts as distant as Siberia and Turkestan. Not a pound of flour can be issued by any of the stores, the distributing points scattered throughout the city, without a written order signed and countersigned by the various bureaus of the commune. From this center, each distributor receives the amount necessary to supply the demands of the given district, according to the norm allowed on the bread and other cards. The Moss Commune is the most popular and active institution. It is a beehive swarming with thousands of employees, busy determining the different categories of piok and issuing authorizations. Besides the bread rations, sugar, tea, etc., given to the citizen by the store of his district, he also receives his ration in the institution that employs him. The piok differs from the quality of the citizen and the position he occupies. At present, soldiers and sailors receive two and a half pounds of bread per day. Soviet employees, three pounds every two days. Those not working because of age, sickness, or disability other than military, receive three-quarters of a pound. There are special categories of preferred piok. The academical for old scientists and professors whose merits are recognized by the state, and also for old revolutionists not actively opposed to the communists. There are preferred piokes in important institutions such as the Comintern, the Third International, the Narco Minodel, Foreign Office, Narcomput, Commissariat of Railways, Sovnarkos, Soviet of Public Economy, and others. Members of the Communist Party have the opportunity of receiving extra rations through their communist organizations, and preference is given them in the departments issuing clothing. There is also a Sovnarkom Piok, the best to be had for important communist officials, commissars, their first assistants, and other high-placed functionaries. The Soviet houses where foreign visitors and influential delegates are quartered, such as Karakhan's Osobniak and the Hotel Lux, receive special food supplies. These include fats and starches, butter, cheese, meat, sugar, candy, etc., of which the average citizen receives very little. I discussed the matter with our house commissar, who is a devoted party man. The essence of communism is equality, I said. There should only be one kind of piok, so that all will share equally. The RKP Communist Party decided the matter long ago, and it is right so, he replied. But how can it be right, I protested. One person receives a generous piok, more than enough to live on, another gets less than enough, a third, almost nothing. You have endless categories. Well, he said, the Red Army men at the front must get more than the city men. They do the hardest fighting. The soldier at home also must be encouraged, as well as the sailor, they are the backbone of the revolution. Then the responsible officers deserve a little better food. Look how they work, 16 hours a day and more, giving all their time and energy to the cause. The employees of such important institutions as Narcomput and Narco Minodel must be shown some preference. Besides, a great deal depends on how well a certain institution is organized. Many of the big ones procure most of their supplies directly from the peasantry, through special representatives and the cooperatives. If anyone is to receive preference, I think it should be the workers, I replied. But they get almost the worst piok. What can we do, Tovarish? 
If it were not for the cursed allies and the blockade, we'd have food enough for all, he said sadly. But it won't last long now. Did you read in the Is Vestia that a revolution is to break out soon in Germany and Italy? The proletariat of Europe will then come to our aid. I doubt it, but let's hope so. In the meantime, we can't be sitting and waiting for revolutions to happen somewhere. We must exert our own efforts to put the country on its feet. The commissar's turn in line came, and he was called into an inner office. We had been waiting several hours in the corridors of the various bureaus. It seemed that almost every door had to be entered before a sufficient number of resoluci endorsements were secured and the final order for supplies obtained. There was a continuous movement of applicants and clerks from office to office, everyone scolding and pushing toward the head of the line. The waiting men watched closely that no one got ahead of his proper place. Frequently, someone would march straight to the office door and try to enter, ignoring the queue. Into the line, into the line, the cry would be raised at once. The sly one, here we've been standing for hours, and he's just come and wants to enter already. I'm Vine Ochcheredi, not to wait in line, the man would answer disdainfully. Show your authorization. One after another came these men and women, Vine Ot Cheredi, with slips of paper securing immediate admission, while the tale was steadily growing longer. I am standing three hours already, an old man complained. In my bureau, people are waiting for me on important business. Learn patience, little father, a workman replied good humoredly. Look at me, I've been in line all day yesterday since early morning, and all the time these Vene Ocheretti kept coming, and it was 2 p.m. when I got through the door. But the chief there, he looks at the clock and says to me, says he, No more today. No orders issued after 2 p.m. Come tomorrow. Have mercy, dear one, I plead. I live seven versts away, and I got up at five this morning to come here. Do me the favor, Golubchik. Just a stroke of your pen and it's done. Go, go now, the cruel one says. I haven't time. Come tomorrow. And he pushed me out of the room. True, true, a woman back of him corroborated. I was right behind you, and he wouldn't let me in either, the hard-hearted one. The commissar came out of the office. Ready? I asked. No, not yet, he smiled warily. But you'd better go home or you'll lose your dinner. In the... Karitonensky, Sergei was waiting for me. Berkman, he said, as I entered, will you let me share your room with you? What do you mean? I've been ordered to vacate. My time's up, they say, but I have nowhere to go. I'll look in the morning for another place, but meantime, you'll stay with me. But if the house commissar should object, are you to be driven into the street in this frost? Remain on my responsibility. This has been a production of Audible Anarchist. You can find more Audible Anarchist on YouTube.